uh, we are going to have our first GBM after our AGM. And uh, I would like to call uh, President Mahadevan to say a few words. Thank you, Aditya. Uh, good evening. On behalf of my team at IRMA, it's my pleasure to welcome all you members to our general body meeting. I also extend my warm welcome to all the past presidents who have been the guiding force and the strength behind the organization. The current union budget presented by our Honorable Finance Minister is a progressive one with an emphasis on infrastructural and national development. Our expert uh, guest speaker Sri Silesh Seth will be covering the finer points of the same. Industry is poised for a leap forward and this provides a golden opportunity for all we SMEs to grow our businesses further. At this juncture, I am pleased to announce our much-awaited biennial seminar under the convenership of uh, our past President Sri Siddharth Shah and our managing committee member Mr. Manish Khandekar on 8th of June at Faria's Hotel Lonawala. The theme of this uh, seminar is going to be sustainability and the green initiatives in the resident industry. This is a topic which is very relevant in uh, today's uh, terms as every industry talks about sustainability and we belonging to the resin industry or the coating industry should let uh, to look at uh, areas wherein we are able to provide more of sustainable solutions so that the future generation has something to rave about. I would uh, ask the conveners to share a few thoughts on the above things for the seminar. I request a wholehearted support from all the people present over here to be a part of the seminar. Join us in large numbers. Be proactive in the entire process and ensure that we are able to have a great seminar ahead. Wishing you all a great evening ahead. Thank you. Uh, I now request uh, Siddharth Bhai, who is our uh, convener. See, we have designed our uh, seminar brochure and I would like him to inaugurate it. Manish, Ajao, Ashe. Please, Are you are part of the team designing it. Ajao. Uh, brochures will be sent out to all our members uh, from next week onwards and uh, we seek all everybody's support, patronage to make this biennial seminar once again a big success. Irma's biennial seminar is looked upon by uh, our industry friends in a big way, uh, the way, way it's organized and I'm sure under uh, guidance of uh, Siddharth Bhai Shah, our entire team will make all the efforts to make this successful. Thank you. Not guidance only by me, but all the past president also, whoever has conducted, I mean, almost everybody has conducted this seminar. So, especially Prashant Bhai is there with me and uh, so please, everybody has to attend this conference and tell your friends also who are members of our association. I mean, this is open to all, even pain people can come. We have not kept only for Irma. So, all will be beneficial. We will try to make the event a grand success by very good speakers and people will, I mean, Prashant and all, they will help us in getting good uh, speakers and good subjects. Thank you. I now uh, request uh, Siddharth Bhai to welcome our speaker for the day, Sri Shailesh Shaitji. Shailesh Bhai, please come on the dais. I now request, uh, request Bhagesh to introduce the speaker of the day, Sri Shailesh Shetji. Thank you, Aditya. So, good evening, friends. Uh, 
I have been faced with a difficult task of introducing a person who's uh, need who needs no introduction actually. Uh, so um, I'll proceed. Uh, Mr. Shailesh Ji Seth uh, uh, is an advocate by profession. Uh, his firm's name is SPS Legal. Shailesh Ji has a massive experience of over 35 years in consulting, advisory, and litigation practices in the field of indirect tax laws that include central excise, service tax, customs, state VAT laws, CST, and GST. CLSG has dealt extensively in areas of central excise, service tax, customs, GST, CST, VAT across the entire trade and industry spectrum consisting of manufacturing, service sector, and distributive trade representing diverse sectors. Shailesh Ji has also been a regular faculty at various professional bodies as well as trade and industry forums on his chosen field. Already he has delivered more than 130 lectures since April 2017s on various subjects of GST. Shailesh Ji is a regular columnist in Vyapar, a bi-weekly business newspaper and also in Midday on service tax, central excise and GST. He has also contributed number of articles to various magazines as well as taxation websites like TIOL. He has written more than 110 articles on GST since the introduction of GST in India. Shailesh Ji has been awarded a special award of appreciation in 2019 by the Pen and Stationery Association of India and Indian Textile Accessories and Machinery Manufacturers Association. He has also recently been conferred with the Special Jury Award under the category Fiscal Journalist at TIOL National Taxation Awards 2021. Besides professional bodies like Chamber of Tax Consultants, Shailesh Ji is also associated with various trade bodies including Indian Merchant Chambers, BSE Brokers Forum, Builders Association of India, Brian Mumbai Developers Association and other bodies guiding them in the field of indirect tax including GST. So without any further delay, let us welcome Mr. Shailesh Seth. Um, Sailesh Ji is a very diverse person as you can see from his biodata which was read out by Mr. Bagesh. We have the pleasure of uh, having a book released by him uh, today. So I would request all of you to please uh, join us in getting this book released. Over to you Sailesh Ji. Pleasure to be with you practically after three years. Yes. Or maybe this will be the fourth year. Before, uh, and I'm also grateful to Irma and all committee members 
including Siddharth Bhai, for, uh, you know, this, extending this privilege to me for releasing this book. This is a, there's nothing so great about this book. I had already released it in the e-book form on 11th of January, uh, the, from the hinterland of conscious. This contains uh, some uh, random reflections of mine, which in English I've been sharing with Siddharth Bhai at least. He's on my WhatsApp group. And I don't keep diaries. I've never kept diary. But I read, I read a lot. And more than that, I think a lot. So, these are the thoughts which have been striking me at very old time, out of nowhere. Sometimes when I'm, even when I'm dictating, uh, you know, some appeal or reply, I would just jot them down and I've been sharing it. And I was really surprised at the warm response I received. And then there was insistence from the friends and others that, uh, why don't you come out with the book? Because in last January, uh, my first uh, poetry collection came out. That's a poetry collection, Dark Room Ni Bhitare. That's uh, Inside the Dark Room, uh, to roughly translate it in English. That contains my 87 Gujarati ghazals. Yeah. So that came out uh, in the last... Uh, anyway, literature and particularly poetry is my first and last law. Mm, I'm in law because I'm destined to be in law uh, as a field for my means of livelihood. This is not my life. If my life is, my life may be this, not this GST and all. So, and uh, then this is the... This is purely a non-commercial venture. This can't be commercial. So, I have told Mr. Kanan, uh, these books are here. I'm sure all of you would, uh, you know, uh, uh, not only one copy. If you feel like, you can take as many copies as you want with you. Totally. These reflections are not on any particular theme or subject. They are random thoughts. And as I have written in my preface, they are just like the clouds drifting in the sky. No direction, no shape, no speed, no, no color, nothing. I've been able to capture them in the words by God's grace. And uh, because if I reflect something on a particular theme or subject, then it requires conscious effort, like on GST. So if I'm on a GST, then it requires conscious effort on my part to study that subject, analyze it, prepare everything. This has come from conscious. So there can't be, they can't be conscious. I can't be conscious. This has all come from the unconscious mind. Totally. And uh, since, uh, and I have dedicated this book to all those for whom the life is not merely a matter of breathing, but also of living. And uh, copyrights are I have written it. The copyrights are of mankind as a whole. There is no copyright of said in this book. And yes, price is a bit heavy because price is, as I have written, the price is introspection. So if you are willing to pay that price, this book might be for you. So, and these are random thoughts. I will not go into these uh, thoughts or anything. The thing is, these are I can't claim copyright on this for the simple reason, again, as I have mentioned in my preface, that I don't know what I have read, whose impression is on my conscious or unconscious mind, when these thoughts are taking shape in my mind, when it hits me. I don't know that. I can never know that. What I have read, what I have understood, what I have seen, what I have listened to, all these things might have played part uh, when these thoughts have come out. And that's why, as I quoted the Jew poet who was a Nobel laureate, uh, Samuel Agnon, and in one of his, um, in his interview, he had said one remarkable thing, and what he said was, I'll put it into Hindi, and that is, kin kin gayo ke dut se apna pind banta hai, unka hame pata nahi hota. You can never put your finger on it. 
okay, which cow's milk has actually nurtured you. Right? And that has remained the guiding spirit for me throughout my life in my profession. And that's why I don't claim any copyright in whatever I do. As far as my profession, like PPT, I've been sharing. I've been sharing everything. And I'm not doing anything great. I think I'm supposed to do that. Society has given me too much. So it might be my humble repayment. So with these thoughts, I hope you will all enjoy this book. I would love to have your feedback. This is not something that I, the book is about 200 pages. There are 200, approximately 180, 85, uh, you know, captions or quotes are there. And uh, if any of them finds any resonance with any of you, this, uh, you know, the, it's a well-earned effort on my part. So, so, with this we come back to our uh, GST. Friends, uh, this is the February Union Budget 2023 has been the, this was the fifth consecutive budget and the last before the general election due in 2024 presented by our FM, current, present FM. So everybody was expecting that budget will be as usual populist, keeping the general elections in mind and there will be freebies and vote note. But see, for once the FM has been extremely cautious and pragmatic. This is the shortest ever speech given by her, 87 minutes. One of the shortest budget after independence. In length wise, the budget speech is of only 8140 words, which itself is also a record. Because the longest budget speech of Dr. Manmohan Singh, and that was 18,650 words. One of the longest speeches given by our very FM, which lasted for more than 200, uh, 2 hours and some odd 25 or so minutes when she had to ultimately stop and three times she had to take water. So, so this is from that reckoning, this is the shortest uh, speech of hers, 155 paragraphs. And what is also very interesting about this entire uh, proceedings, budget proceeding, when she was delivering her budget speech, that our uh, Honorable Prime Minister, thumbed the desk 124 times in a speech of 87 minutes. So, there's something very interesting. So, she spoke, but budget is clear, clutter-free, precise, simple, and confident. The dark clouds of the recent, particularly post-pandemic, as if they are all dispersed, sun has come out, sun is shining. And the same confidence is used by the economic survey also. So India can look forward to uh, some interesting uh, times ahead. And at least about that, I personally don't have any doubts. There will be challenges. There ought to be challenges, such as economic recovery and thereafter economic, then sustainability of that recovery and then going on the economic growth, never going to be easy, right? And why should it be easy also? But from the future perspective, from the, as a economic growth, as, a, as one of the most uh, emerging, developing economies of the world, fastest growing economies of the world, India's place is uh, now, you know, it is well placed. Totally. Coming decades are going to place our country uh, and mainly because of the citizens of this country, particularly trade in business and industry. We are remarkably resilient people, innovative people, adaptable people. Yes. And uh, I know, I mean, particularly for the younger generation, the next generation, there are some extremely exciting times are ahead 
in the coming decades. She's talked about, uh, you know, seven Saptarsis. <laughs> she talked about Saptarsi, seven priorities of the budget, inclusive development, job creation, and all she has talked about that. I'm not going into the details. The our seven Saptarsi, you might be knowing, different, different, uh, our epics have given different, different names over a period of time. But generally, the seven Saptarsi are Atri, Bhardwaj, Gautama, then Jamdagni, Kashyap, Vishwamitra and Vasishta. These are the seven Saptarsi. <coughs> the emphasis on capex and this is how basically the entire revival of economy via job creation through capex is going going to be the you know the mantra of the day which she has started in right earnest for past few years and we are seeing the right? then digital economy including artificial intelligence and the she has also encouraged the states to undertake massive cap capex and uh, I mean, and to set it as a priority. So there are more or less. I will be clearing, uh, covering all these aspects in my salient aspects of the budget into my private PowerPoint presentation, which I'll be sharing next week to the members. Today it was a little bit difficult for me to prepare that. As far as indirect taxes are concerned, I will not speak anything about direct taxes because it's not my subject. So I wouldn't like to venture into it. I may have some academic interest into that. I need to have. Like you, I am also a taxpayer. But uh, something in which I wouldn't like to venture is a subject uh, expert. Coming to indirect tax, the proposals of the finance bill, in even in her speech also, she has only spoken about customs. There is not a single word on GST in our budget speech. And this is something very unusual and unique. After introduction of the GST on 1st July 2017, this is the first ever budget where there is not a single word on GST. If we consider excise and service tax which have been subsumed in GST, with any other uh, indirect taxes, then be probably first, uh, you know, budget okay, where there is not a word of indirect tax, so to say, except customs. And why this is so? At least I am not surprised. I was not surprised when she did not say anything on GST. For the simple reason. That there were quite a expectation, major expectations from the finance minister on front. And there have been representations and representations from the different different sectors and industries. Automobile, CG, consumer durables and what not. And those expectations as usual were reduction in the GST rate and reduction in the number of GST rates, we still have the number of rates which are into double digit. Then, the <coughs> setting up of the GST tribunal in GST. Now, these are certain major aspects. It will make some However, I would not even say that the hopes were belied because the, there was no place for being in the first place. Article 69A, which was introduced as a part of the Constitution, 101st Constitution Amendment Bill, which paved for the introduction of GST in the country, 
right the entire legal constitutional framework is constitutional amendment act 101st 101st constitution now article 269 it speaks about gst council and the powers of gst council on all these aspects unless and until Sir cannot make any amendments. Whether reduction in rates per se, that is tariff rate. I am not talking about the rate through the notifications. Tariff rate is to be reduced, or number of rates are to be curtailed down. Even for those also, council recommendations are mandatory. we had two only two meetings since the last budget 47th meeting in june and 48th meeting in december whatever recommendations were made by the council on the aspects of the which is normally the having the fiscal impact trading uh, the tariff related amendments concessional rate withdrawal or prescribing or etc as well as the statutory amendments in the rules forms etc which could be done through notification they have already been done but where it was required where the statutory amendments in the act itself is required be it cgst act or igst act or compensation says act those can be done those amendments can be done only through finance bill by the finance minister based on the recommendations of the council and those amendments which have been recommended in last two meetings are you will find uh, they find place in this budget on gst these are statutory amendments but rest of the amendments pertaining to the rate and everything concessional rate or whatever they have all been carried out through the notifications so what is to be remembered as a as a as a sector as a industry is that as far as gst is concerned it is round the year budget one need not wait for the budget to make the presentation representation yes pre budget representations go which can the council can take it up uh, in its own course post budget like now the next meeting will be somewhere in the first week of march but gone are those days where you we used to have bulky representations on all aspects you know indirect tax excise custom service tax pre budget then the meetings with the north block you know and then we would anxiously and eagerly await the proposal finance minister speech whether uh, our representations have found some merit or not less or not it's a waste of time if we start talking about the such type of structural changes major amendments uh, in the budget because that requires council's recommendations so i was very much amused when uh, you know i've been reading about all sorts of representations which are being made by the industry pre budget and then awaiting amnesty scheme in customs or gst or amnesty scheme in direct tax okay direct tax is different see as विवाद से विश्वास तक फॉर एम एस एम ई सी एज ऑलरेडी कम आउट विथ इन दिस बजट राइट बिकॉज ऑफ कोविड वेर एवर द पेमेंट्स हैव नॉट कम एंड द डिपोजिट्स हैव बीन फोर पीच है बिकॉज द एम एस एम ई यूनिट हैव नॉट बीन एबल टू सप्लाई सो दो नाइन्टी परसेंट डिपोजिट विल बी नाउ रिटर्न सो सम सॉर्ट ऑफ डेट टाइप ऑफ विवाद से विश्वास स्कीम इज ऑलरेडी बीन मूटेड बट अदरवाइज ऑन जी एस टी फ्रंट or custom for, uh, custom see could have brought but probably this is not the time gst there was absolutely no scope for any such amnesty scheme and so but then making representations is also a professional business you know is a so we keep busy we keep ourselves busy we keep our clients busy okay yes आपके लिए हम ये रिप्रेजेंटेशन बनाएंगे नॉर्थ ब्लॉक में जाएंगे सीबीआई से बात करेंगे वगैरह वगैरह वोट कुड़े बिन अचीव इज एनी बडीज गेस 
today the one need not be nostradamus to predict what is going to be there on gst front in the budget any simple layman tax payer can any of you can also easily predict on gst front what is going to be the budget one has to simply take out the recommendations of the council of the last meetings after last budget uh, what are the which are the statutory amendments which have been proposed which can be made only in the act through the finance bill this will come that's all one need not be expert on the law for that purpose so the other thing to remember is that if there are concerns or there are some genuine expectations or demand for the industry you need not wait now for the next budget on gst front those representation can go continuously for the council to be taken up you need not wait for the next budget you know whatever may be this is for the from the industry and sector perspective with this background let us see what it holds so all together there are some few amendments in the cgst act couple of one amendment in igst act and two major amendments uh, sort of in customs act apart from the tariff related amendments in customs when i say tariff related amendments means the doing away with the exemption or providing exemption or calibrating the rate of customs duty etc etc so we will try to have a uh, some look at this tariff related uh, the all these amendments the first and foremost is the gst amendments which are contained in clauses 128 to 144 of the finance bill i am probably old fashioned and orthodox so i use the word clause till the time the finance bill becomes the act then it becomes section so you we need not uh, so when you read finance bill you will every everywhere you will find section 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 this something for me it's something strange i have been witnessing this trend for past few years but call it close or section for your purpose so it is 128 to 144 these are the clauses we deal with the gst related amendments and the first and the first question to be asked is whatever whichever these amendments are when they will become effective as we see section 1 always section 1 of every finance bill is traditionally worded like sub section 1 of section 1 uh, this act shall be may be called the finance act 2023 and sub section 2 will be the provisions of so and so to so and so shall come into the force on the date of the unless otherwise specified on the date of the enactment of the bill or like that and these are the standard this is standard language we have been witnessing on section 1 because it gives you which provisions will be effective and it only does not pertain does not talk about only indirect tax related proposals also direct tax related proposals so sometimes you will find there are few proposals which would become effective again both direct and indirect tax there are few proposals which would be effective from the date of the budget that is from the 1st march itself uh, sorry 1st february itself there could be few proposals which would be effective from the date of the enactment of the bill that is when the bill receives the assent of the parliament uh, honorable president after both the houses passes the bill there could be few proposals which will be effective from 1st april if it is so notified particularly in the context of the direct tax and there could be few proposals which would be effective from the specific date uh, provided in the specified in the proposal itself whether prospective or retrospective but it will be with the introduction of gst another dimension is now added to this entire effective date concept and that is in context of the gst if you see last four budget the proposals of the finance bill uh, are generally it is specified will be effective from the date to be notified by the central government and 
central government would notify the date based on the recommendation of the council so none of these amendments first of all will become effective from the date of the enactment of the bill forget about from the date of the bill itself first april first bill. and why this is so after this bill is enacted and they become part of the cgst act the mirror image of all these amendments will have to be uh, inserted will have to be carried out by all the state wet legislations as well as the union territory so all the state gst act and all the union territories gst act will also have to incorporate the very same amendments in their respective acts which is a long drawn process because that can be done through the state legislative assembly and then the assembly passes those amendments like maharashtra or gujarat or whichever state is and after all have done their jobs the council will take the call and then notify okay, from which date this will be effective like last year finance bill uh, finance act 2022 budget two amendments became effective from 1st july 2022 and rest of the amendments became effective from 1st october 2022 so the last four budgets actually mention about this that gst related amendments will be effective from the date to be notified by the central government again this year there is a departure from this practice subsection 1 of finance bill 2000 that is clause 1 does not speak about the date to be notified by the central government why i am lost where is the need for the departure from this uh, practice but tru circular budget of 1st february issued by cbic central board of indirect taxes and customs tru circular says that the amendments proposed in the finance bill on gst front will be implemented as far as possible from the date to be notified by the central government on the recommendation of the council tr you circular says so there are some legal issues arising out of all these uh, unnecessary complications but i am not going into that so suffice to understand that the amendments which we will be talking about will all be effective uh, at a future date not on the date of enactment of the bill not immediately they will not become immediately we will have to wait for the central government to notify the date which they will probably do after all the states have done their jobs this is one coming to the clause composition levy the provisions relating to composition tax payers are contained in section 10 of the cgst act and this composition tax payers as we know they pay at the fixed rate on their supplier and they, it is attached to lot of conditions however composition tax payers were not allowed to sell their goods supply their goods and services via electronic commerce operators eco they cannot like flipkart or anybody they cannot do that this budget now proposes uh, to allow the composition tax payers to supply their goods to eco also but not services that restriction remains but a small time composition tax payer can now supply the goods via electronic commerce operators so amazon or flipkart or they can do that other conditions remains one of the major conditions uh, concerning the composition tax payer scheme is that interstate supply of goods is not allowed if a person is engaged into interstate supply of goods then he cannot off for the composition scheme levy this restriction will continue even while he is being allowed to operate through eco then there is much talk about this uh, facility or relief being given to how far the small players will be able to tap the wide market through operator through all this eco remains to be seen whether they have uh, resources and infra 
to really operate through the ECO or not, one has to see. But it's a good beginning, I mean, uh, how, who will be able to take the advantage of that, one has to see. Then the second one is input tax credit and uh, here comes the issue. There are four major amendments concerning input tax credit. One appears to be a procedural uh, and uh, two are serious. The first one is input tax credit is uh, basically subject to lot of conditions. GST or wet system the one of the major chief objectives of this uh, policy is to avoid the cascading effect of tax on tax. And we are all aware about that. So, I mean, I will not go into the detail. Now, by, by now, we know what is cascading effect of tax on tax. So, with the weight and sand weight, and we are now aware. We call it set off, call it input tax credit, call it mod weight credit, call it sand weight credit. The fundamental principle uh, objective has been to avoid the cascading effect of tax. How it is being given effect to? As far as uh, there are three methods like capital addition method, subtraction method and invoice credit method. So almost all 195 and odd countries who have adopted the GST or weight across the world have gone for the invoice credit method. So I procure my goods and services on payment of tax under the cover of tax invoice. I take the input tax credit of whatever tax is actually reflected in the tax invoice. I utilize that input tax credit for the payment of my tax on my output supply. So effectively, I am paying the tax only on the value addition. That's why it's a value added tax. To put it very simply. So, but one thing is a, a comprehensive, seamless input tax credit is basically, is fundamentally the soul of GST system. If you go on discouraging or disallowing the ITC on one pretext or another, you are striking at the very, the fundamentals of this system. And have we really moved in what direction on this? In what direction our law has taken us as far as GST is concerned? Section 16 of CGST Act very boldly claims Every registered person, a registered person shall be entitled to avail the input tax credit on all inward supply of goods or services or both, used or intended to be used for in the course or furtherance of business. So, any goods or services which you as an entrepreneur, as an industrialist, as a businessman, you use or intended to intend to use for the in the course or furtherance of business is principally theoretically shall be available by way of a I mean tax paid on it should be available by way of a ITC. This is the bold statement made in section 16 1. The condition is it should be in the course or furtherance of business. Now that is then subject to conditions and restrictions which are contained in section 16 2 subsection 2. And the original four conditions were goods or su supply should have been received under the cover of invoice, which is a prescribed tax invoice. There should be an actual receipt of the goods or service. Supplier should have paid the tax by case or by utilizing in admissible ITC. And finally, the buyer should, recipient should have filed the return. In the same way, last budget, there was a, another condition added about the supplier's liability. Suppliers should have paid the tax. One more condition, there are two other conditions under section 16.2 are the supplier, buyer should have paid the supplier within 180 days from the date of invoice. If you do not make the payment within 180 days, then on 181st day, the Recipient taxpayer is required to reverse the credit with interest. And afterwards, when he makes the payment, he can recredit the whatever 
tax is actually debited, ITC is debited, interest is the cost. Basically, this is to facilitate the SME. A large unit should not really take the MSME for a ride and should not hold back on their payments. We had a similar type of restriction under standard credit rules also. So, I mean, there, once, there is no way about this. How far this is effective and that's a different matter. But it says if the buyer or recipient fails to pay the supplier, fails to pay, I will just come to that on a few minutes. So, this is one condition and then there is a condition stipulated time limit under subsection 4 of section 16 that the credit can be availed uh, latest by, it should be availed latest by the return to be filed for the September month of the next financial year. So, this current year credit April 22 to March 23 any invoice under which you have received the inverse supply of goods or services, the credit can be availed by you till 20 October 2023. From April to March, any invoice, the credit can be availed up to 20th October 2023. The date on which you will be filing 3B for the month of September 2023. So, these are the conditions. Now, this 180 days concern has now been, there is a procedural change because 737 under which you file, the taxpayer files the GSTR 1 return for the outward supply, monthly outward supply, GSTR 1 return. That has undergone a mark change because that two-way system, that system will enable the uh, taxpayer that how much, these are the credit, these are the invoices under which you have received then taxpayer recipient will confirm that and then the credit will be populated. All these things never work. It was never supposed to work. So, that has been now done away with. So, in line with that, some procedural changes have been made to align it that within 180 days, if the payment is not made, then the buyer has to make the payment with interest. He makes the payment, say, after 9 months, Whenever he makes, there is no time limit for that. He can recredit the amount, but interest is his cost. The next amendment is under section 17. We spoke about section 16 granting the seamless or whatever. Basically, it's a shameless credit. It is not a seamless credit. So, the under section 17, there are certain provisions restricting the ITC availment and there are three aspects of that. Section 17 subsection 2 speaks about that if any outward, if the input or input services are utilized, if the person is engaged into some personal expenditure and the taxable activity like the car, car used for the wife, normally wife only uses the car, okay? Only the car is booked in the name of the company, that's all. So, so, personal expenditure, then you cannot, it's a different matter that the ITC is not available on the business, uh, on the car also, unless you are into rent as well. But just giving you an example, then if you are into exam supply and taxable supply, then we have a proportionate credit. Right? That is again a condition. Now, section 17.3 speaks about, for the purpose of proportionate reversal of credit, and this is very important, how to determine the proposed value of exempt supply? Exempt supply means exempted under a notification or chargeable to nil rate of tax or it is a supply on which the tax is not leviable under the CGST Act. This is the definition of exempt supply. Schedule 3 to CGST Act lists the activities or transactions which are declared as neither supply of goods nor supply of services. Sale of land. Neither a supply of goods nor a supply of services. Sale of building, not under construction flat. Sale of building, same. Two entries were inserted through the budget 2018 made effective from February 19. Altogether three, but entries are two, seven and eight. 
entry number 7 it speaks about the warehouse goods imported warehouse goods uh, cleared before uh, the clear, uh, movement of the imported warehouse goods before the clearance of the for the home consumption so when i am importing the goods suppose and for any reason i do i am not in a position to clear i can relegate it to the custom bonded warehouse right so i find the into bond bill of into bond bill of entry and then when i am clearing it for the home consumption i will file the ex bond bill of entry pay the customs duty is applicable and clear the goods but before that before clearance final clearance for the home consumption sometimes the goods changes hands from one warehouse to another warehouse so you are selling the question is what has now been done this has now been put under schedule 3 last year i mean 2018 budget it has been put under schedule 3 so the movement of warehouse goods imported warehouse goods from one warehouse to another effectively one owner to another owner before it is cleared for home consumption cannot be considered as a supply so there was no question of levy of igst on and the levy of gst on that this position remains but what has now been done this transaction is now proposed to be put under the value of exam supply so if there is a clearance of goods warehouse goods prior to home consumption from one warehouse to another warehouse from one warehouse keeper to another warehouse one owner to another owner on obviously on a commercial basis this will be this is a no supply no i mean this will be effectively treated as a exam supply and therefore proportionate reversal of itc issue will arise on common like your chartered accountant your auditor so auditor is auditing your account charging you gst one of the activities of your business activities is imported goods warehouse and then sold to another and they are still confined to warehouse and it will be treated as a part of the value of exam supply and this can have some serious repercussions in the coming days at the actual when it will be implemented and uh, the question here is basically can is this a supply at all movement of warehouse goods to another warehouse goods before home consumption clearance does it qualify to be supply under gst act if it cannot be treated as because this is the movement of imported goods which remains bonded they are not cleared for home consumption no customs duty are paid also on that so they are all within the scope of the customs authorities when you file the export bill of entry then only you pay the custom duty how can it qualify to be a supply for the purpose of gst act if it is not a supply can it be considered as a exam supply the same question can arise even for sale of land sale of land or sale of building are the transactions in immovable properties gst is only on the is is a tax on the goods or services or both gst is not a tax cannot be the tax on immovable property constitutional framework is very clear if you see article 246a and the constitutional framework it only speaks about a levy of tax called gst on the supply of goods or services or both constitution does not even allow cannot allow the gst to be levied on the immobile property now putting this sale of land under schedule 3 in a backdoor manner it has become equated with the exam supply and because it is exam supply there is a there is a fiction created there is a provision made under section 17 3 that sale of land will be treated for the purpose of value of exam supply it will have to be included so you are a taxpayer you are running an industry you are paying the tax on your all manufacturing manufactured product 
you have a land in your name company's name you sell that land and for that purpose it will be treated you have a taxable supply and you have a exam supply a chartered accountant having a land of his ancestors property in his name he is paying the tax on his ca activity a professional is paying the activity but he decides to sell the land uh, in his which is holding on his village in his village when he sells that land it will be considered by a deeming fiction as a exam supply he is availing some few thousand rupees of credit on his day to day activities on the which he is running as a ca uh, he will have to account for that sale of land as a exam supply and reverse the proportionate credit so sale of land sale of building transactions in securities and now it is proposed that the this transactions of 8a which is movement of warehouse goods before air for home consumption can also be prescribed its value can also be prescribed as a exam supply for the purpose of value of exam supply wait and watch on this there could be some fireworks on this but the issue remains is this a supply can this be treated as a supply can it be first of all subjected to gst if it cannot be subjected to gst then how can it be declared as a exam supply exemption follows the levy exemption does not determine the levy there has to be first levy then only the question of exemption can arise alcoholic beverages are outside the purview of the levy of gst petro products are outside the purview of the levy of gst where is the question of giving exemption to them they do not fall within the scope of levy the other amendment which have been made is the two other insertion that is a eight b two other entries which were introduced simultaneously one was any supply of goods from a non taxable territory to another non taxable territory uh, without bringing it in india so a buyer a, 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 a businessman is in india arranges for the goods to be he buys the goods from japan and heavy he has it shipped directly to us or germany goods do not enter the custom frontier of india at all such transaction take place daily it's a out and out supply right without bringing them to india a funny question most absurd question arose whether this will also attract gst or not when you are not even bringing you are issuing the invoice you you because your buyer in us you will be issuing the invoice and you will be getting the remittance also one advance authority ruling spoke about this that this does not attract gst because this is outside the purview of the levy jurisdictional perspective when the goods do not enter the custom frontier of india where is the question of deciding whether custom duty is applicable or not or gst is applicable import and export definition under custom act is very clear are very clear another advance authority ruling obviously took a different view now to obviate all this confusion or in the name of that Uh, what has been done this entire transaction activity is now specified in schedule 3 schedule 3 is what neither supply of goods nor supply of service and it is now placed under that schedule from 1 to 2019 onwards 2019 first february 2019 supply of goods from one non taxable territory to another non taxable territory without bringing it in india another entry which was introduced simultaneously from this february 19 was uh, to put it very simply without going into the technical jargon high seas sell when the goods are on international waters high seas sell takes place even this has been also put in february 19 budget uh, in this schedule 3 i am again hammering this point schedule 3 is listing the activities or transactions 
which is neither supply of goods nor supply of services. So it cannot be subjected to GST. But you see the now repercussions. If these two fundamental transactions basically, uh, if they were outside the very purview of the levy, no GST could have been levied on that under any circumstances, where was the need to specify it in Schedule 3? And by specifying Schedule 3, it came from 1 to 2019. So, auditors have now started raising the demand because they were looking for these opportunities. Yes, now it is no supply, no goods from 1st February 2019. But from 1 7 2017 to 1st February 2019, you pay the tax on it. Because now it is declared as a no supply. And there are huge demands which have been raised by the audit. So mercifully, you see the comedy of errors. Once you get into one absurdity, to justify that absurdity, you have to go on being absurd. Right? So first, you, end, you, make, you insert certain provision in the Schedule 3 sum entry which is outside the purview of the law. Now, once it, it was found that the department has started raising the demand for the past period, they have now come out with this budget. There is a proposed amendment that the insertion of this entry will take effect retrospectively from 1st July 2017. In other words, these transactions, one, out and out international supply without bringing the goods in India, and high seas sell, these two, they were never considered as liable to GST right from 1st July 2017. Retrospective amendment. Hmm? Those, I mean, people have gone gaga over this. Oh, what a relief. What a relief. Something which was never required. One. And on top of that, the provision is also made. However, we are making it retrospective. No liability for the past period. If any liability is now actually arising or auditors or department has raised, once this budget, is, uh, the uh, provision is notified, it will go. Fine. They say, however, if for any reason, if somebody has paid the money on this type of transactions, suppose you have paid IGST, on your supplier, on, uh, on your supply to US, but you have purchased the goods from Japan or Germany, directly supply to US. For any reason, you have paid the tax. No refund. There is a provision, if you have paid it wrongly, no refund on this. We are making it retrospective. So, all those who have made, I mean, from 1-7-2017, in my view, first of all, these are misnomer. This is a complete, I would not even call as by way of an abundant precaution because there was no need for the precaution. This transaction under any circumstances could not have been subjected to GST. So, retrospective amendment or no retrospective amendment, if anyone has made, any taxpayer has made any payment of tax, whether by way of during investigation, during audit, pursuant to audit, or otherwise, subject to obviously other unjust enrichment and other, they are entitled to claim the refund. They are. Article 265, no tax should be collected without authority of law. So, even if the provision is made for no refund, in my opinion, it does not make any difference whatsoever. The other amendment pertains to CSR. Corporate Social Responsibility. There is no major amendment on this. What has been done is, CSR stands for, as is understood, Corporate Social Responsibility. From now onwards, CSR may stand for Corporate Sole Responsibility. It was a Corporate Social Responsibility. Now it will become Corporate Sole Responsibility. That is the only amendment. And how? Section 135 of Companies Act 2013 requires you to undertake these CSR activities. 
and there are serious repercussions if uh, you know this is not undertaken and the expenditure is not actually made whether this expenditure can be treated as a business expenditure or not for the purpose of income tax is another contentious issue the issue arises whether the goods or even services which are expended which are procured on payment of tax for the purpose of undertaking csr activities whether input tax credit is available or not can it be said to be in the course of business for the purpose of my business or not this issue had arisen even under sanvet credit rules rust while excise and service tax also whether sanvet credit benefit is available in respect of csr activities or not in sl propec case mumbai bench of the tribunal mumbai bench of the tribunal has held in favor of the taxpayer that csr is certainly which is mandated by law it's a business expense it is for the business because without if i do not incur the implications are very serious to such an extent that i may not be able it may disrupt my entire business activities so they have held it to be as a input service however the issue remained even under gst there are two rulings reported rulings of the advance authority ruling in bombino pasta limited case and darkis sugar where the advance authority ruling says csr activities and the you know inward goods or service in relation to that can come within the scope of inward supply so therefore itc is available there are two rulings one by kerala bench polike buyers and there is another adama india private limited where they have said can no uh, this cannot be treated for the as a business expenditure so the itc is not available now there are conflicting rulings and with this confusion which was right from post G, pre gst days also has been there it was expected because this has become a burning issue so it was expected there were a lot of representations made before the gst council that some clarification should come and there is no ardhi and there is no logical reason why the itc should be disallowed to the taxpayer to the business uh, on the csr activities so it was expected that the clarification will come yes recommendation has come but the recommendation has come not to allow so now section 175 which speaks about the block credit it lists the various activities on which itc is not available there is another clause fa small fa has been introduced whereby it is clearly provided that no itc shall be permissible in respect of the csr related activities and that's why i said okay, it's a corporate sole responsibility now it's a double whammy you incur this expenditure uh, you fight with it and whatever like kerala kerala had a massive flood recently so the goods were actually polike wire was only on that case so they procured the goods for the purpose of this uh, you know as a flood relief they and, uh, and they claimed it as a part of csr that was allowed by it authorities but whatever gst was paid on that itc was not allowed by the advance authority ruling this is all going in the reverse direction if you see the list of the itc which is not allowed various activities goods or services one would really wonder okay, what is the where is the seamless credit where is the comprehensive coverage of the input tax credit that's why i use the word it is not seamless it is shameless if you see the statement of objects and reasons when the constitutional bill was mooted there is there is a mention about the avoidance of the cascading effect by allowing the input tax credit very carefully the word comprehensive or seamless was not used in that however the august 2016 faq released by the cbic the first two questions very boldly claim that under proposed gst regime the businesses will be benefited because there will be a seamless comprehensive availability of the input tax credit 
which is nowhere to be seen. There are more and more and more restrictions. Not a single space has been left under this law uh, where, uh, you know, where you cannot squeeze the taxpayer and disallow him the ITs. Every conceivable avenues have been tapped. How I can disallow the ITC? A classic example which is before the Supreme Court is Safari Retreat. The commercial complex is constructed by the developer. Units are actually leased out. On the leasing, he pays the GST. But steel and cement used or other services used for the commercial complex, credit is not allowed. Section 17.3. You set up a plant for the manufacture of the goods and whatever services or goods or services primarily under 17.5 C and D, credit is not allowed. And then you have to look into the explanation and exception and proviso with a, with a microscope, okay, you know, where I will be able to take the credit. Rent a cab. And all, I mean, all these restrictions continue. From Senvet to ITC, you will hardly find any difference. Totally. And CSR is another list, another entry which is added. Coming to the other important amendment is about registration. There are three provisions we deal with the registration. Section 22 person liable for registration. Section 23, person not liable for registration. Section 24, compulsory registration. So, as you know, under GST, up to 20 lakhs supply, I mean services, and 40 lakhs now goods, there is an exemption. Unlike the previous years, a time-tested practice of granting the exemption from payment of duty or service tax by a separate notification, GST law does not have a single notification exempting the small taxpayers from the payment of tax up to a threshold. There is no notification. Like service tax, we had a 33 by 2005 talking about the uh, you know, 10 lakh exemption. In uh, SSI exemption, we are all aware about 8 by 2003, one and a half crore and then up to subject to maximum 4 crore. Was the outer criteria, exemption was one and a half crore. Right from 175 by 86, mode weight days, when it was introduced, 7.5 lakhs, 25 lakhs. Then it becomes 75 lakhs, then 1.5 crore. Like it has seen its own avatars over a period of time from 86 to uh, till 2016, 17. GST does not have any such notification. There is an indirect way of granting the exemption up to a threshold of 20 lakh or 40 lakhs. And that is, you are exempted from registration up to this threshold. Now I am exempted from registration. Uh, it means that I am not required to pay tax up to this. Because if I am into a taxable supply, I have to take the registration. But if I am not, I am not required to take, take the registration up to a particular threshold, it means up to that threshold, I am not required to pay the tax. It is a very convoluted way of actually granting the exemption. Generally, my exemption should be there first and then the question of my taking the registration or exempting from registration should arise. Here my exemption from, from registration decides whether I am exempted from the tax or not. Up to what limit? Now, what have, has been done, section 23 which is persons not liable for registration, it has now been made very significantly this amendment has been made. It has been made overriding section 22 person liable for registration, overriding section 24 compulsory registration. So, even if I am exclusively engaged in any activity under which I am, for which I am, which is exempted. Now, I am not required to take the registration at all, even if it falls under the compulsory registration clause. This is an amendment. I am not going into the details of this amendment because it will directly, may not affect you much. We have an academic interest. This is otherwise a very significant amendment. So, there is another aspect of this amendment, the language and the re repercussions and that is, that reminds me one of my very favorite quotes of Voltaire 
French philosopher. Voltaire has said, there is no torture worse than the torture of laws. This amendment is a classic example of how torturous the law can be. When you analyze and read and interpret it, you will come to know. And we are doing that. But I will not bother you. I will confine that torture to myself. I will not torture you further on that. Okay. Then comes the... There are four amendments prescribing the time limit beyond which one will not be able to file. Defaulters will not be able to file the return. GSTR 1 under section 37. GSTR 3B under section 39. Annual return under section 44 and the statement by ECO, electronic commerce operators, under section 52. There is a time limit. However, it is now prescribed that if you have failed, a taxpayer has failed to file the return by due date, he will not be entire, he will not be allowed to file it beyond three years from the due date. So three years is the outer time limit now. Again, there is a proviso. However, Central government on the recommendations of the council subject to such conditions and restrictions as may be prescribed may relax this. One. Second, last budget which has now been effective, made effective from sub, uh, 1st October 2022, subsection 4 of section 37, this is subsection 5, subsection 10 of section 39, this is subsection 11. Those two provisions which were inserted last year for GSTR 1, section 37 is GSTR 1, GSTR 3B is section 39. Those provisions clearly mandated that if the return for the previous period is not filed, then one is not allowed to file the return for the current month. Because people used to file, taxpayers were found to be filing the current month return, even if they have not filed the returns for the previous period for whatever reason. So there is a now restriction. If I have not filed the return for the previous period, I cannot file the return for the current period. This restriction is also there for 3B, which is my basically input test credit adjustment for payment which I am making on 20th. 3B also has another condition. If I have not filed the th 1, GSTR 1, I cannot file 3B. If I do not file this return for 6 consecutive months, then there are serious consequences which will follow including the suspension and cancellation of my registration. Now, here there is a time limit for the cancellation of registration if there is a consecutive failure fa failure to file the return for a particular period, which is much lesser than three months, three years. There is an apparent conflict between these two provisions. Why are you allowing me to file up to three years? Where is the, mention, where is the, met, where is the meaning beyond, beyond three years or not beyond three years? Because the moment I cross that particular limit and I do not rectify my error or lapse, I run the risk of actually cancellation of my registration. And that time limit is much lesser, much lesser than the, shorter than the, uh, the three years time limit which is given. What is the purpose and how actually what they want to achieve by this, I really don't fail to understand this. Then coming to there are no few more, I mean there are not many more over here. The restriction on the refund, delay in refund, yes, uh, punishment. We have, all of you must have read too much about decriminalization of the GST laws. We have been reading about that the, the decriminalization because there was a lot of UN cry about GST law and the way the provisions are being implemented, arrests are being made, they are all on rampage. And I am not hesitant to say that that at the grassroots level, at the ground level, I am sorry to use this word, there is a sheer jungle raj which is prevailing. Sheer jungle raj as far as the implementation of this law is concerned. Totally. If you have not bear on the brunt of that, you have not faced it, you are lucky. And if one considers that one has seen the worst of the GST, one is mistaken. You have not seen anything of GST so far. Real drama to will start now. So, the, and 
outright yes fake invoices gst is a very fraud prone tax very fraud you need not be expert to say this operating through the invoice credit method gst is bound to be a fraud prone tax and these are this is this is the problem not with india almost every country is losing badly heavily they are bleeding on gst frauds carousel frauds missing dealers invoice factory they call it invoice mills then remaining below uh, not suppressing the turnover these are standard crows are black everywhere we are not only uh, intelligent and innovative in this aspect there are people across the world who have inborn allergy to pay the tax so it is always there right? and operating through invoice credit method invoice is the soul heart of the gst system and in our country as i always repeatedly say invoice is the largest selling commodity in this country as we know hmm? pure invoice is the largest selling commodity totally so then because of that fake invoices invoice factory printing invoice is the cottage industry in this country right so so all this aspect mismatch and matching and everything i'm not going into that this e invoice and all but yeah but the question here is about decriminalization and what provis which provisions have been decriminalized out of the long list of offenses which actually would attract the arrest which three obstructing the officers one two provide not providing the required information to the officer or providing the false information or destroying the evidence or records is cruel joke absolutely cruel joke i would call it a this decriminalization attempt is a criminal joke find me one how many instances are there when a tax payer would obstruct the officer doing his job or he would destroy the evidence or he would purposely knowingly give the false information out of the long list of serious offenses which are listed uh, only these three have been picked up and, and and they are making headlines decriminalization of the gst laws and we are falling prey to that and people are simply going gaga over it particularly we professionals you know what a grand gesture by the government like that but this is what is in store for you coming to the there is another very important amendment relating to the data privacy and business secret about the sharing of information some more serious thoughts are required on that again today i'm just not leaving section 152 has been amended and uh, they are taking the powers to share the information subject to certain condition this needs to be very seriously studied okay, whether it in, uh, you know the attacks my uh, business secrecy and my data privacy and uh, the last one is about uh, one important very interesting uh, two amendment igst act in igst act there is a place of supply one of the you know cornerstone of the gst laws wet policy you have to determine the place of supply of goods or services then there are section 12 13 deal with all this so if in case of suppose two buyers where is a uh, the supplier freight forwarder is in maharashtra exporter is in maharashtra destination of goods is say any country in europe or us right freight forwarder is arranging providing the services to the exporter now there was a confusion in view of the current existing provision under section 12 subsection 8 proviso that whether ig is to, to be paid because the place of supply in such type of case is, is the destination of the goods destination of goods is outside india and therefore ig is to is payable so there was a, always a conflict whether cgst is to is to be payable or ig is to is payable board has clarified ig is to is payable whether I, any gst is payable or not is a different matter we have reservations about that even in that case also i have my own reservations whether gst can be demanded on this grounds now what is being done this proviso is being omitted 
and therefore what will happen exporter is in maharashtra freight forwarder is in maharashtra destination of goods is say germany but both of you are located the supplier of the service that is freight forwarder recipient of the service which is the exporter shipper both are in maharashtra therefore now onwards after this is notified and it becomes effective the cgst and sgst will be payable and not igst will be payable after this amendment yeah. whether this can be subjected to tax at all or not that something is to be looked into and uh, the other aspect about is there is one interesting amendment under central sales tax act section 19 there is an interesting amendment section 19 speaks about the dispute arising under section 6a the burden of proof in case of inter trade transfer and section 9 of cst act and this goes to cst appellate authority tribunal now all these cases which are right now pending before cst tribunal central sales tax appellate tribunal appellate authority which are pending will now get shifted to custom excise service tax appellate tribunal there are not many but cst related cases which involves whether this is a interstate transfer related to interstate transfer dispute suppose you are transfer stock transferring the goods and cst authority says this is the sale of the goods interstate sale there are number of such disputes okay, whether it is a stock transfer or whether it is a sale all these disputes which are pending before the tribunal cst will now go to cst state i think the reason could be post gst state authority is no longer in existence and cst tribunal one of the constituent member has to be the state officer so that's why they are now probably paving the way for them and they have shifted to gst and on the custom front only 5 minutes custom front uh, there are many changes cs continued with the policy of reviewing the exemption out of 196 exemption notification 146 conditional exemption the time limit has been extended by 1 year 2 year or 4 year, 5 years they are for the further review statutory amendments there are some tariff related changes and uh, lastly for settlement commission whatever it's worth settlement commission now there is a provision which is proposed which is amendment that once the application is made before settlement commission it has to be decided within 9 months from the date of filing of the application and if it is not decided then what if you are expecting that if it is not decided by settlement commission then it should be deemed to have been decided and the claim as per the taxpayer it is too much to expect that is not the case if it is not decided within 9 months then the application will abet and you will go back to the adjudicating authority so whether this you are a victim of the delay on part of the settlement commission or a taxpayer is a beneficiary of the delay of the settlement commission very difficult to say after 9 months if it is not decided then it will abet i have gone to settlement commission because i don't want to get into litigation for whatever reason i don't want to get into litigation that's my whole purpose now my application is not decided within 9 months therefore that application will abet i will again go back to the socos notice and i'll again fight what type of provision is this so these are the major i'm not going into the tariff related amendments so friends apart from these amendments there are number of major amendments which have been carried out as per the recommendations of the gst council at 47th and 48th meeting which have now become the part of the law which will which affects or has a bearing on your day to day operations these are also sort of a precursor Uh, to the coming days what type of amendments can be expected my sincere suggestion to you all will be all those amendments which are very important there is another extremely dangerous amendment which has been made which have been made effective under custom regarding some the custom valuation related rules okay, whereby if the custom authorities are suspecting the undervaluation then what type of action they can initiate a time tested provisions of section 14 and 15 regarding the valuation of the goods import goods that has been now put to the test complete apple cart is proposed to be disturbed there are very serious provisions 
regarding those those provisions also i try to contribute my article on that so these are certain amendments which need to be looked into in detail otherwise these are the major amendments be watchful the gst law is not going to stabilize or settle down uh, no law tax laws are never settled down as the i mean it's very famously said law should not be static law should be stable but that stability is nowhere to be found here so we are going to have there is a chinese curse is my favorite chinese curse and that is may you live in interesting times but it's a curse with this curse i will end my talk thank you very much thank you so much sir and uh, congratulations for your book launch again it's going to be a interesting read and uh, okay i welcome siddhat bhai to felicitate uh, shri shailesh shet ji with a little gesture of appreciation and i call upon uh, hirin vice president irma for uh, the official vote of thanks thank you thank you <laughs> thanks good evening ladies and gentlemen now i am the only one between us and cocktail so wait for 2 minutes at the outset i would thank all the members for coming here and not attending pm modi's gathering and helping us in good number i would like to thank our president mr as s madevan for taking irma team forward and a beloved shailesh seth who definitely needs no introduction for irma uh we wish him all the very best for his new book launch thanks once again for the informative book sir i'm sure that all of us will be immensely benefited with the lecture and the book as well i would like to thank our honorary secretary mr aditya chandrachud and executive secretary n kanan for making all the arrangements over here and making us feel comfortable i would also like to thank the management of the chembu gymkhana and the caterers thank you now uh, before we uh, break just a couple of announcement a uh, couple of announcement one uh, first one is that i would like to wish uh, rajesh ji a very happy birthday parso unka 70th birthday tha aur uh, kanan ji ka birthday do din mein aane wala hai so wish you a very happy birthday in advance and i also request you all uh, shailesh ji has uh, kindly brought few books uh, to distribute amongst our irma members so kindly collect your copy before you go thank you so i call the meeting as closed